Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for watching. Let's talk about the antisocial personality disorder. Well, first of all, it's a personality disorder. So what's personality disorder? Well, that's an enduring pattern of behavior that's inflexible and it's pervasive. It occurs throughout a person's life in occupational and social and personal activities. It's stable and it's of long duration. It tends to cause significant impairment clinically, selves and others not accounted for on the basis of a psychiatric disease like schizophrenia. It's not associated with medical disease, not due to a medical disease like substance abuse, not due to head trauma. Well, personality disorders, of which there are 10, are subcategorized. And in cluster B, those are the four personality disorders where there's dramatic and emotional and unpredictable interactions that occur with others. And in this group, that's where we find the antisocial personality disorder, narcissistic personality disorder, histrionic personality disorder, and borderline personality disorder. And these share some similar symptoms. But interestingly, the antisocial personality disorder is the one that can't be diagnosed during childhood. During childhood, people suffer a different condition. They suffer the conduct disorder, a condition called conduct disorder. Sometimes it's diagnosed, sometimes it's not diagnosed, but it's a forerunner of the adult antisocial personality disorder. Now, there's a problem, and the problem is in diagnosis. How do we make the diagnosis? Well, there are no standard ways to make the diagnosis. There are no standard tests or serology, blood tests. There are no x-rays, no electroencephalography, and unfortunately, at least here in America, the American Psychiatric Association keeps changing their definition of what the condition is. So in 1932, they were calling it psychopathic personalities, and they published a series of collections. Then they kept coming out with different editions of what we call the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, edition one, two, three. Now we're on edition five, published in 2013. And even in the 2013 edition, they said that there are going to be some changes because they haven't gotten quite right yet. So what is the basis for antisocial personality disorder? Well, it's manipulativeness. So use of seduction and charm and glibness and other behaviors to ingratiate themselves to obtain their personal ends. These people tend to be dishonest and they're fraudulent. They misrepresent, they embellish themselves. They tend to be callous and lack concern for the feeling of others. They lack the feeling of guilt. They don't have any remorse. They tend to be aggressive and oftentimes sadistic. Now, not sexually sadistic necessarily, but sadistic, meaning they harm others and they take some enjoyment from that. And they tend to have hostile personalities. They have angry feelings. They react poorly to minor insults. They tend to be mean and nasty and vengeful in their behavior. And they have a disregard for their obligations. They make promises. They don't keep them. They have financial obligations. They don't follow through on them. They tend to be impulsive. They act on the spur of the moment. They act and they don't really have any plan for action on the basis of whatever happens. They tend to take a lot of risks. They take risks and they don't even regard the consequences. They tend to get bored easily, but unfortunately their boredom causes them to act impulsively. They also get an egocentric behavior where their self-esteem that they derive from the personal gain or personal power or pleasure. They have goal setting that's based on their personal gratification and failure to conform with social norms or lawful behavior, ethical behavior. These people have a lack of concerns for the needs or the suffering of other individuals. They have problems with intimacy. They have difficulty with marriages. They tend to engage in exploitive reactions with other individuals. They often use dominance. Now, as I mentioned, the DSM-5 already says that, well, in their Section 3, 
they need to consider some emerging measures and models so that they have to consider adding some egocentric behavior, self-dramatic behavior, shallow affect, and superficial charm. And they say that there's some movement closer to considering these people to have psychopathic personalities. Now there's a major argument about whether we're talking about antisocial personality disorders as distinct from psychopaths, or are the two the same, or is there some overlap? But the International Classification of Diseases, that's the World Health Organization, they refer to what we call antisocial personality disorder. They call it dissocial personality disorder. And they call it psychopathology or psychopaths. They say it's a long-term pattern of disregard for the rights of others. They violate the rights of others. They have a low moral sense of conscience their lack of personal compass. They often have a history of criminal or legal or impulsive issues. They tend to have some aggressive behavior. They're socially irresponsible. And they exploit people and they don't show any remorse. According to the World Health Organization, the International Classification of Diseases, they have to have three of six features. One of the features would be callous or not concerned for the feelings of others. Another would be gross and persistent attitudes of irresponsibility and disregard for social norms or rules or obligations. Another is incapacity to maintain enduring relationships. They can establish relationships, they just can't keep them. These people have very low tolerance for frustration. And when they become frustrated, they tend to react with aggression and with violence. They don't have any capacity to express guilt. They don't experience any benefit from having made an error and then growing because of it. And they tend to blame others because of whatever actions that seem to cause them negative input or they rationalize their behavior. Now these people tend to be persistently irritable. Sometimes these people are referred to as amoral or antisocial. It's a relatively common condition. About one to four percent of the general population with men manifesting symptoms of antisocial personality disorder may be three to five times more frequently than women. Estimated somewhere between two to four percent, maybe even as high as six percent in men, maybe half percent to one or maybe two percent in women. If we look at people with antisocial personality disorders as adults, they manifest signs of the conduct disorder during their childhood. These people also seem to have difficulty with their IQ. They sometimes have reading difficulties. The peak age for manifestations tend to be somewhere between about 25 and 45 years old. And the manifestations are somewhat decreased in people over age 45, but those statistics come from a criminal population. In people who aren't involved in the judicial system, we don't have any real good evidence for the condition decreasing as a person gets older. Well, one of the reasons that we have a decrease in the incidence as people grow on to their later years is because these people have a higher all-cause mortality rate. They die off more early than other individuals. So let's go over again some of the symptoms. So they have no regard for the rights of others. They're manipulative with charm, superficial charm or they manipulate through violence or intimidation. They don't show any guilt. They lie frequently. They can behave violently or impulsively. They typically don't fulfill their obligations either at work or school or home. They often violate the law. They manipulate other people for personal gain. They're incapable of forming long-term stable relationships. They can't sustain employment for a long period of time. These people frequently end up with divorces or unemployment or homelessness. They don't show any compunction against exploiting other individuals for their own gain, for their own personal pleasure. They're arrogant, 
They tend to think negatively about other individuals. They tend to be callous in regard to their attitude for people that they've harmed. They're often reckless. They fail to consider the results of their actions on other individuals. They disregard their own safety, the safety of other people. They tend to lash out. They sometimes can be violent, provocative, frustration. Their interpersonal relationships are relatively poor. They lack attachments. They lack emotional bonds with other individuals, except through exploitation. Their family relationships are strained. They have seductive charm. They're dishonest. Mayo Clinic says, additionally, they have a disregard for right and wrong. There's persistent lying and deceit. That's to exploit other individuals. They have poor abusive relationships. They tend to feel that they're superior and they're extremely opinionated. Well, there was Theodore Millen, who's a psychologist here in America. And he subdivided the antisocial personality disorder into five different types. Now, it's not recognized by the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of the American Psychiatric Association, World Health Organization, but it kind of makes sense. So he divides them into one group that tends to be malevolent. These people are belligerent and they're vicious and sadistic and they're brutal and they're callous. Then the covetous antisocial personality disorder types. These are domineering and envious and they're hostile and they take pleasure in taking but not in giving. Another one is risk-taking antisocial personality disorder where people tend to be bold and audacious and foolhardy. They pursue perilous ventures. Then there's the reputation defending. They need to be thought of as infallible. They're indomitable. They're overreactive to various slights. And then we have the nomadic antisocial personality disorder. These are drifters and they're vagrants. Their mood centers tends to be doom and invincibility. Well, people who have the antisocial personality disorder tend to have a variety of other psychiatric conditions as well. So whenever a person has a psychiatric disorder, chances are there will be another or an two or three other psychiatric abnormalities. So the comorbidities, we call comorbidities, that tend to run along with antisocial personality disorder are the affective disorder, so anxiety and depression, quite frequently show signs of the narcissistic personality disorder. But the people who have narcissistic personality disorder tend not to be aggressive, they tend not to be so deceitful. There's borderline personality disorder or bipolar personality disorder. And then there's substance or alcohol use, and that causes a problem because you can't tell which came first oftentimes. Is it the antisocial personality disorder led to the alcoholism, or is it the alcoholism led to manifestations of the antisocial personality disorder? People also have sexual disorders, and they have sadistic disorders, they have impulsive disorders, and they have gambling disorders, and they have somatoform disorders. And they have an increased incidence of what we call comorbid risks. So they tend to be involved in more accidents. They have more traumatic injuries. They tend to make suicidal attempts. Because of their impulsive actions, they're more likely to get hepatitis C and HIV. And the overall mortality is increased compared to the general population. Now, the treatment. Well, we don't really have any good treatment for a personality disorder. Personality disorder is something that you're born with. It's kind of like having blue eyes. You got blue eyes for the rest of your life. Well, if you're born with a personality disorder, chances are you're going to have a personality disorder for your life. And it might change a little bit over time, but you still have the personality disorder. Well, we can treat some of the comorbid problems. So if you have anxiety or if you have depression or if you have aggressive behavior, well, we can treat those with some kind of medicines. But we can't really treat the underlying personality, personality problem. First was recognized a long time ago. But in modern times, in the 1700s, Penel from France wrote about mania sans délire. And that's mania without confusion, affective disorder. That was in the criminal population. 
Now, more recently, people have argued, is a psychopath the same as an individual with an antisocial personality disorder? Some people say yes, some people say no, some people say there's an overlap, some people say there are two completely separate conditions. But it seems that if we look at the World Health Organization, that's the International Classification of Diseases, their definition of the dissocial personality disorder is pretty much akin to what people think of as the psychopathic personality disorder. So it appears that they're relatively the same, if not the same. These are people who have all of the manifestations that we just mentioned. But it seems that the antisocial personality disorder is defined more on the basis of behavior Whereas psychopathology or the psychopath, that's the underlying personality. And some of these traits, as I mentioned, are similar to those of the narcissistic personality disorder. Well, the psychopathology or the psychopaths, that came into being sort of officially in about 1941 when Hervé Cleckley he wrote a book called The Mask of Sanity, and that was furthered by Robert Hare. He was a psychiatrist, and he came up with a checklist. And he started off in 1980 with a very long checklist, and then it was gradually winnowed down, 1991, a revision, 2003, a revision. Now it has about 24 different items in it. And some people say that that's a good checklist for the psychopaths. Well, it seems that some people would say that psychopaths are just uh, an extremely malignant form of the antisocial personality disorder. Some people say that most psychopaths meet the criteria for the antisocial personality, but not all people with antisocial personality meet the criteria for psychopaths. But since the definition of these conditions is subject to change without any consideration other than all of a sudden it's changed because by fiat they make the change, well, I think you have to consider the conditions relatively the same. So, when we talk about the conditions, we say that there's the underlying conduct disorder that occurred during youth that seems to lead to antisocial personality disorder. It's frequent forerunner. And it tends to be diagnosed in people less than age 10 to 15. Now, it's more severe if it's diagnosed before age 10. It's less severe if it's diagnosed after age 10. About 25% of people with conduct disorder diagnosed in childhood, women, will go on to antisocial personality disorder as adults. About 40% of men diagnosed in childhood as having the conduct disorder, they're going to go on to manifest signs of antisocial personality disorder during adulthood. Now, the conduct disorder is a repetitive and a persistent pattern of behavior. It's impulsive, it's aggressive, it's callous, it's deceitful. These are people who tend to get involved in petty crimes and fights and steal and vandalism and they manifest deceit. They have difficult time with authority. And punishment doesn't seem to make any difference to them. Their conduct is not dissuaded. Now, just like with the adult psychiatric disorders where there are frequently multiple, so too with conduct disorder in children. So these are the children who tend to have more manifestations of the ADHD, the attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, they have more psychiatric difficulties, they have more academic problems, more family dysfunction, they can engage in substance abuse. Well, where does this all come from? Partly it's genetic. It appears that there's some sort of genetic manifestation. It might account for anywhere between 30 and 50, 60 percent of the antisocial personality disorder, certain kind of hormones or certain kind of interactions with the neurotransmitters might be at fault. And then always we tend to blame adverse childhood experiences. But there are so many people with adverse childhood experiences that grow up to be relatively normal. 
with these individuals maybe with some physical or sexual abuse or family neglect or problems with their peers or some sort of trauma in childhood. They grow up in a family where the cultural norms are different from the rest of us. Or they have maybe some underlying abnormality in the prefrontal cortex that we can't really define, at least at the present time. So what's the prognosis? Well, these people are unlikely to seek help. They seek help when they run into problems with authority and they're jailed and they're sent to see the psychiatrist, or the family sends them because of some other kind of problem like the anxiety or the depression or the substance abuse, criminality, that occurs, but tends to decrease over a period of time. As we mentioned, that the treatment Unfortunately, we don't have any good treatment for the underlying personality disorders, whatever they are at the present time. They just seem to be resistant to any change, whether it's medical or whether it's psychological interventions. What's the prognosis of the condition? Well, there's a small chance that the condition will remit, about 25% over a period of time, but about 30% they'll improve a little bit without remission, about 40-50% they're going to show no manifestation of improvement. These individuals are going to be hard to deal with. They're going to have difficult time with their families, with their friends, with their work environment. And that's the story basically of antisocial personality disorder, often referred to, as I said, as psychopaths. Unfortunately, the condition causes a lot of havoc leads to considerable harm, leads to harm in the individuals themselves and the people who interact with them. Seems to be associated with a variety of other psychiatric abnormalities like narcissism and anxiety and depression and sadism and borderline personality disorder. And some people suggest that all you have to do is you look to Washington, D.C. to find an example of a given individual who has this kind of disorder. Now, don't try to comprehend the actions of people who have the antisocial personality disorder on the basis of what you would do or what you would think a rational person would do. Remember that the person is acting not as a normal individual, but as a person whose judgment is impaired by the underlying antisocial personality disorder. Anyway. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend. Consider subscribing so you'll be notified as we post new videos. I appreciate your interest. I'm Dr. Ken Landau.